Show. All right. Welcome, Juan. Welcome to Thrive. Here is where you thrive. Um, so we were talking a little bit about um, how much I edit the podcast. And I really don't. It, like, I, I make this sound like a little bit nicer if, if, if it sounds weird. I think that with every episode, it's getting a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I, I don't edit it much. I mean, I, if you get outrageous, you, if you start talking about something that is going to put you in jail, I'm probably going to take that out. Probably going to take that out, but otherwise it's going to be a, a fluid, raw, just conversation. Thank you for not letting me go to Yale. <laughs> and thank you for <laughs> inviting me to thrive. I'm, I'm thrilled to be in thri thriving. Yeah, man. I'm excited that, you, that you're coming today because I was reading your stuff. You, I knew you were famous. I didn't realize you were that famous. I didn't realize that you have like stuff in the Museum of Art, like in the permanent collection of the Museum of Art. What do you have there? So yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a cool one. Um, because usually like, you, you, like it's not really famous. Like it's, it's near, it's not nearly advertising famous. Like it's just the thing that in advertising, they give a lot of awards. Like there, there's a big award circuit. It's almost like in, in movies, but you don't get paid as much. Like, they have the Oscars and you have the Golden Globes and you have like all these awards and probably you have more like indie awards and, and all that. And there's like a big award circuit in advertising. So you get a lot of recognition for what you do. And it's kind of like this intersection of art and commerce, which is kind of cool. But, um, but like there's people that are actually really famous. I think that the, the thing is that because I'm a Colorian, as, as are you, um, yeah. it's like, it's like you, it's like you, just because no one has done anything like that before, mm. it, it, may, it, it like makes a mark. So there was no like, like I think the little thing was like our college back in Ecuador, the yeah. University of Casa Grande, like they put like a billboard when we won our first line because it's like our former students are winning like awards. Um, and, and so they put a billboard in, the, in, in our college and my, my parents and my aunts were texting me like, hey, I saw a billboard of you. And so it's not really like mainstream famous. It's like niche. It's like famous in the advertising industry and it's not nearly that famous because there's really big names in the industry. Um, but the, the, the thing about the Museum of Modern Art in New York is like there's this award show that it's um, called uh, the a a AICP. Uh, awards which the the award like the, it's just you submit your awards and it's usually like they have a, a film category it's the main category and the ACP next which is kind of like the weird ideas that are not necessarily films and if you win that and, and they're super like they don't have that many winners like it's I don't know like 15 20 winners a year okay. they get inducted into this sort of like mini hall of fame thing where they keep they record your film or they have that archive in the museum of modern art so that it gets stored forever and that's really cool so, so can i go see it like the yeah, museums are opening there. finally next week so i'm definitely gonna go so where do i find you there so i think you have to go to the archive of the thing it's not like on constant display okay. i'm not sure if it's on constant display but it's on the archive and if you go to to the aacp website uh, there's like the like it, it has all the winners there with all the videos for the commercials and and there's like um, it's in the permanent connection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and that sounds like pretty cool to put. That a, does a, sound cool. Now let me ask you something. So all your commercials are there? Not not all. Only the winners. I have I think I have two. Oh, Wait, two. is the Burger King the the artificial intelligence one there? I'm not sure if we submitted that to because I I changed agencies and. And when when the submission for that for that award show in specific came, I'm, I'm not sure why it was at the end at the time, but um, uh, I'm not sure if, if they send it here. But uh, I'm not, like previous working work, like the Wuhan, the Whopper work that we did, uh, it, it made it there. Um, that and and a Heinz uh, campaign that we did with uh, like Mad Men, uh, it's also there. So we have like cool. two two pieces of work sitting there in the archive. Amazing. So we're going to live forever in a museum, which is pretty cool. 
Well, I, I really hope that they submitted your Burger King ones because if they did, I'm going to feel like I'm in the museum too. Like I, I'm going to yeah, feel no, like I, my work I think, there. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Like that, I, usually like when you, when your friends know that you're in advertising, like they're pitching you these crazy ideas that you're like, man, that, that'll never work. <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no way I can sell this to the client. They feel like, it's like weird, like, because I think like every human being is creative. You just have to sort of like learn how to do creativity for a purpose and that right. purpose being selling shit or for a cause or for whatever you were well, like for whatever purpose you're doing advertising for or brand or product. So um, in in this case, it's, it's, it's kind of like you, you have your friends like pitching you ideas that it's just crazy. Like, <laughs> like there's no way like a client would do that. But then, like, but how about in that case where you send me that tweet of, um, and we tell this openly, it's not like we, we hate it, like we right. made it public. It was like, you sent, uh, you sent me a tweet of uh, Keaton Patty, this like comedian, really funny guy on Twitter. Uh, and and he, he, does, he does this thing where he's like, I submitted a thousand hours of, I think it was Olive Garden commercials. Uh, mm -hmm. And I created this bot, this, algorithm artificial intelligence thing where i submit like i i, I feed the bot with a thousand hours of an olive or olive garden commercial and then, then it writes it learns it learns how to write its own kind of like with an algorithm and artificial intelligence so uh you send it, that to me of course it's a parody and it was fucking right. hilarious and i was like it's fucking hilarious i still read it every once in a while we have to do this for burger because <laughs> it's like super self like the brand super super self-deprecating and, and all that and it was like, I remember it was early June because uh, two weeks after that, we meant we were in Cannes, in the Cannes, like the Cannes Advertising Festival. That is a week before, or like two weeks before the film festival, the really famous one. And, but the, the advertising one, it's also the most famous one for advertising. Um, and I was there with the client and we built a small deck with the tweet that you sent me. And I was like, look, a friend, uh, this crazy psychologist friend that I have. Psychiatrist. Psych psychiatrist. Sorry, psychi psychiatrist. Yeah, I know, I know you get offended by that. Psychiatrist. <laughs> well, we just have, study like 25 time. more years. Uh, at but that yeah, time, no big deal. At that no time, you, were, you hadn't graduated yet. Like this was like 2017 or 18. Yeah, probably. So um, I, I, we showed him the idea, me and, and Ricky, my partner. And we're like, we have to do this. Like, we have to hire this guy to write like fake bot written uh, commercials for Burger King. And he said, fuck yeah, let's do it. Fernando Machado, our client for Burger King, is now our client for Popeyes. And we did it like the next and the next year we submitted it to Ken. Uh, and it like did incredibly well. Like it won like a golden film, which is the toughest category. It won a golden radio, like all the hardcore, hard to win categories, it won. And and that was pretty cool. And and I, I told you, I, was, I, I like, I was eternally grateful for you doing like sending me that tweet because an amazing idea came out came out of that. That that is so so much fun and of course I feel amazing for for giving you that idea. But I, I I'm, you're also being very humble, right? Like you executed that idea into actually something funny. And and I also think that you were being a little bit too humble when you were saying that it's like only a you're like a niche famous, like an only mildly famous. Like I'm reading this like number one copywriter in the world according to the Cannes Line Global Creativity Report. That shit sounds like important. That shit sounds important, man. Yeah, it's like it's super important. It's super important for me. I love advertising. I love what I do. Uh, but like, it's not like you know. Like, if I tell you to tell me like one famous advertising guy, you probably say Don Don Draper, Don Draper and that's it. <laughs> right. That's right. He wasn't like a teacher. <laughs> He's fictional. But there's like advertising that the faces of advertising are not like famous outside advertising like it's, you know the people in the industry just like uh, a psychiatrist like you're like you know the famous psychiatrist i know freud <laughs> yeah that's and, it and that like, guy was a neurologist yeah like it's not like um it's not known mainstream so yes in advertising in the advertising world it is a big deal and it's an like an industry it's it's pretty like filled with egos so i try to sort of like detach myself and say like remind mm -hmm. myself like i'm just doing my job this advertising yes i can be a number one writer in the world and 
like that sort of like <laughs> humbles me and says like it's like it's just advertising like yes your dads are my dad and my parents my dad and my mom are they're proud of me and all that but and sort of like there's the pride of the country like bringing like putting Ecuador up there and because like none I think there were like few Latinos that made the top 10 let alone like I'm um, like an Ecuadorian making the, the the top 10 and the top one like you know, what that was insane and it was me and my partner Ricky that he made number two a Brazilian made number one that year um and and it was pretty like amazing like for us and for for like the agency and for for Ecuador like because we were making like living up big mark at the at the biggest stage for advertising so kind of like the olympics for athletes like that was the shit like we got the gold medal there and and that felt pretty fucking good knowing that we were like breaking ground as ecuadorians doing that like always with that sort of like mindset and i remember i went to pick up an award with a guayabera one and you know guayabera <laughs> being our right. traditional uh, shirt like uh formal shirt uh, from Ecuador, from and 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 I wore that to stage because I was like really fucking proud. We got our awards, and I received them with with the Guayabera. And, and like a couple of years later, when we did a, a talk, and I think all we were also like one of the first, or if not the first Ecuadorians to give a talk at Can Line because it's like a festival where they give awards and they also sort of like uh, they're speakers. And they're, that year, I remember it was Shaquille O'Neal with Conan O'Brien, like Kim Kardashian, like there's big speakers. They bring like the big guns beyond advertising, like really famous people, not mm -hmm. advertising famous. And um, and it was really cool because we went up there with our client, with Fernando, and it was me and Ricky. And I, again, went with Guayabera, and Ricky went with Ecuador's, uh, the national team, the soccer national team jersey to the stage. Mm -hmm. And we're like super proud to be like giving a talk and uh, like, again, breaking ground, like pushing forward. And, and, and then we got a lot of messages from like up and coming uh, Ecuadorian creatives and people in advertising saying, man, so proud of you guys. And that's like really fucking cool. Like knowing that you're inspiring others to push it because, and it happened to us. Like we didn't fucking believe that it could be done. Like it was so unachievable. It's like, you, if I tell you like an, an Ecuadorian winning an Oscar, it's like, it's like, you see it so far away, like almost yeah. unattainable. And then I remember it was uh, Eduardo Maruri and, and, he and we were we were young lions like we were in the student competition and we won <laughs> representing Argentina because we were living and working in Argentina so we participated there was no in Ecuador they didn't have they didn't have the student competition at that time and so we, re we represent we were Ecuadorians representing Argentina in the World Cup student World Cup of advertising in Cannes representing Argentina which was great but that year it was 2012 I think and Ecuador got its first lion in history as a country. And it was Amazing. a gold lion. And Maruri with Daniel Perez, a friend of ours, and he's now in, in Chile, like leading an agency. Amazing. Eduardo is now in London, like both great guys. They were up on stage with the Ecuadorian flag picking up a gold lion. That's fucking like an Ecuadorian wielding the golden medal. That was like fucking Jefferson Perez, which <laughs> for those who don't know Jefferson Perez, he's like the pride of Ecuador, like the first Ecuadorian to get a medal in the Olympics, like a gold medal. and and it was like, fuck, like, it can be done. And we were there, like first row, like just watching our flag up there. And we're like, it can be done, let's fucking go. And then we got like a Grand Prix and that also inspired like more people. And I love how that is like generation, like you show that it can be done and and it gets done. <laughs> I was seeing, I don't know if you saw it, there's this documentary on Netflix about um, how Indian Americans became like the fucking, rock stars of spelling bees oh really because, yeah yeah it's fucking amazing you watch the documentary it's in netflix it's like spelling bee i don't know what's the name of the thing but it's like a guy for me like an, uh, a guy had uh he was indian american his parents were from india immigrated to the u.s and the guy was like i'm gonna do spelling bee he was great at it he became the spelling bee champion in the united states <laughs> and it's like the i can't remember the name of the award but he won and then all the like all other generations of kids from india were watching him and were like man this shit can be done and then they all focus on that and now out of like i think 80 percent of the winners or 90 percent of the winners are indian american or, or americans from indian descent which is fucking amazing and it all started with a guy showing that it can be done which i think it's great and just like 
added to that. I think like it was really uh, like really amazing for me and for for Ricky, my partner, because like we're both from Ecuador, we're like from the get go doing this shit together that we love. And we never even imagined like getting half as nearly as far as we got. So so yeah, it was pretty cool. That's so like, cool, man. I'm really, proud of you. Like, I'm proud. Really I, 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 when I was like fucking 14 years old, getting <laughs> drunk in the beaches of Ecuador, <laughs> like three three dollar rum. <laughs> getting shit faced on the beach. I never like imagined Phantom getting nearly like not half of, halfway as far as I got. I, I didn't even know. know that I like advertising at that point. You didn't even know that you like psychiatry. You know, even though it was three dollar rum, it was good rum, man. And it was yeah, good time. Point, I don't I don't think my I liver mean, could handle days. that level of rum anymore, but yeah, it was fun. And I think yeah, I was thinking about that as you were talking. Like, you've always been this just, like, funny, like, just say whatever the fuck's in your mind at every single moment kind of guy. Like, what is, if, if there was, like, a thing that you, that you would say took you from there to here, what was that? And, and I'm thinking, like, internal, like, mental pattern almost. Like, what is it that you think was the more important part that brought you here? So, I would say, I think it's two things. Um, one, it's sort of like that, and yeah, I always, I, I, I always like joking around and like saying whatever the fuck was on my mind, and and sort of like had that inclination for storytelling and mm -hmm. just like telling stories, saying jokes, making people laugh, mm -hmm. and and like from at, at that age, like at fourteen or thirteen, we were like we had like this handheld camera. In, in Puerto Rico, oh, Manaví. Right. And, and we were like making like this crappy, I think you, you were featured in one of them, these crappy like fucking uh, films. Like we were creating like films with our friends acting in them, they're us directing and oh, that's about true. ninjas and climbing yeah, yeah. the mountain and, and fighting <laughs> for the stick of truth before in South Park. Oh, I remember oh, that. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like a sword, but it, it was supposed to be a sword, but it was just like a wooden, giant wooden stick and we would fight and we made up these stories and I love that shit. Like I love making up stories. Um, so I, I knew I had the, I liked it. That was the most important thing. I knew I had inclination for that. At first I thought I liked marketing more than I did like advertising because I didn't know the difference. Like when you're like a 17, 16 year old, you just, I was in school just like okay i don't like numbers that much like i like numbers but i don't like numbers that much i like letters more i like reading more and and i have this thing that i like sort of like telling stories and and making people laugh um and at that point i think i wanted to be a politician or like a marketing guy so i could see you being both yeah no i i like i like politics but i have always liked politics like my i you know my family like there's a lot of politicians in my family and 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 I always like was close to the world, and I liked them. But I felt and like your grandfather was, was like president, vice president, vice president, vice president. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and so I I I I was very close to that, but I don't know. Like it felt like it was <laughs> too intense. Like you almost like had to sacrifice a lot, and and the system was like a little fucked up. So you have yeah, to go and change it for the way you want it to, to be. So I think, so the two things, I think one, I had the inclination and two, I, I think I was always a very competitive guy. Like, and you know, my brother, like yeah. we always were, comp I was always competing against him, against him because he would beat me in everything. Like he was better <laughs> at math. He was better at like fucking any sport. He was bigger and stronger. So he would always like, if we fight, we will, like he would beat me in a video game. I would try to fight him with my fists and he would beat the shit out of me. So I was, but I was like, I had like that fucking like relentless competitiveness that I knew like if I put it to good use, it was gonna be like, take me somewhere. And, and, and in advertising, I found that. I found, uh, like, like I told you, like there's a lot of like awards and competitions and it's usually like competing. So it's, I love that, the thrill of competing. I love submitting and knowing if we're gonna win or not. Like, and if we don't win, doing better and trying to win. Sort of, sort of like that ambition, that, that constant need to win or to at least perform at the highest level that you want or that, at the highest level that you can. 
So I think it's that thing that like you when when you have I have the inclination uh, because I'm not sure I'm not saying that you have, you're born like people think that you're born with the natural talent to be a creative. I think that everyone's born creative, and then you just have to build a craft, and and that's work. Like it's just the and and the only thing that takes you there is commitment and and that fucking necessity because it's not like you want to it's like you need like you that have to. you you have to like and now again i was watching the the last dance the documentary from jordan and i was like fuck man the mind like i thought i was competitive that guy is competitive. that guy's like, insane he, he, like he would die if he didn't win the fucking championship um but i think it's that because i think like for example messi or jordan like these guys they're naturally talented but Jordan did baseball, of course, late in his career, but he was not good as, as, as good as he could. So I think to be like really good at, at something in life, that you have to have the inclination, enjoy it, have the, at least some sort of like, I'm not saying I'm going to say talent, but like predisposition to practice it and to be good at it or some skills, basic skills to be good at it. And then it's all about your fucking will to win and to, to be the best at that shit. And, and I think that's sort of like the magic combination. It's, if Messi would have played baseball, I don't know where his career would have ended. He needed to have like that, at least like set of skills of being gifted for that shit. But then if he would be an accountant, accountant or like a psychiatrist, I don't know how good of a psychiatrist he would have been as, 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 he, got, as he is a soccer player, like the best ever. So I think it's kind of like that combination. You need to have some sort of like inclination and enjoyment about it and talent. And then just the necessity to thrive and be the fucking best. Yeah, man, I a hundred percent agree with what you're saying right now. And I can, I feel like I, I can relate in in some ways. You know, it, I, I was thinking, I, I agree. I think everybody has creativity in them. I think, and you tell me what 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 do you think? Because you're the expert in in this field, and then, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how I, how I feel about what you said about ambition and inclination in terms of my life, but. In terms of creativity, at least in terms of creativity when it comes to speaking, I think that one of the things that I love doing is speaking. Like that's part of the reason I'm doing the podcast because I, I just have a lot of fun talking and hearing, yeah. you know, like and you're having conversations and stuff like that. And I think something that I have discovered is that there comes a point that you can talk about the most random, hilarious shit if you allow yourself to just become this Thing that says whatever comes to mind and it, you, you just become kind of silly and then cr like creative creativity comes but before that happens you have to like you have you has it ever happened when you're talking and then there's this thing that you're a little bit afraid of saying because oh i don't know what this other person's gonna think or i don't know what the implications of saying these things are gonna be and then you just like don't say it but the moment you don't say it, you, cannot, you, you start inhibiting yourself to some extent. And as you inhibit yourself, you, you kind of like kill that creativity a little bit and, and the self-expression. And, and if you do the opposite and you say the thing that you're afraid of, like you start saying a, a ton of shit that you're afraid of and then you realize, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's okay. Nobody cares that much. And, and if they care, like you, you figure it out in that moment. And, and after you get rid of all these fears through your speech, then then like cool stuff starts coming. And then, and then you're talking about like this Burger King, like, or whatever, like creativity issue. I don't know. I think that that's how I see it in terms of conversations. Like, what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think, and there's a lot of topics inside that, but um, I think that, so yes, you have to have some, some sort of sense of confidence in to what you're saying and to what you want to say. You also have to have freedom. Like that's, if you put barriers, it hurts the creative process. Um, and luckily for me, usually you don't have to riff. Like you don't have to just come, like I don't have to go to a client with, with, with nothing. I'm not a stand-up guy. Right. Right? I'm gonna go <laughs> throw me a word and I'll deliver greatness to you. And I write, I, 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 write, shit down, I write shit down. Like I, I find an idea, I write it down. And then I write a thousand ideas and then I go through them. And see what's the best thing, the, the most creative thing, and the best thing for the client's business, uh, regarding to the, what the client wants to say. So, and 
and a quick example there, there, there it's we did like I don't know if you remember you remember but we did this idea uh, for net neutrality to try to uh, they were trying to repeal net neutrality mm -hmm. a couple of years ago here mm -hmm. in the U.S. and we're like and we saw in a John Oliver episode like he was like he did one of those episodes when he was like all out against the the FCC the Federal uh, Communications Committee and mm -hmm. and he was like Ajit Pai was the chairman of that and he was just going at him like you know you're not literally destroying him and mm -hmm. explaining why net neutrality had to prevail and 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 sort of like he was going to Senate and Congress and they were going to repeal the neutrality and they will like charge you more for streaming content as opposed to listening to music because it requires more data and they want to control the packages. Complicated explanations that I had to call back up my brother and have, and have me explain how it actually works. Because then we wanted to, we said, okay, we, we want Berkey to have a stand in this issue. And we're like, okay, it's dangerous because you're getting into kind of like a political space. Mm -hmm. So then we went and did some research and found that it was actually a bipartisan issue. Like Democrat, Republicans want, like, wanted the neutrality even more than Democrats. And it was like 89 to 85. Like the numbers, like everyone was in favor of keeping the neutrality. They were just going to repeal it because they wanted to favor, I don't know, the big, the big internet service, pro service providers. Mm -hmm. And so with that data, we went and we said, okay, uh, we want to do something about it. We did the metaphor with burgers explaining how we, how, the, how they would serve your burger if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they delayed the process. And, and after that, like, we got like letters from the White House and it was like crazy. Like we, like they used that, that case as an example in the United, like a Senator from the United States used that video as an explanation of, look guys, this is why it's clearly wrong what you guys are trying to do. So don't, um, which it's pretty cool, but yes, that connects me to a second thing inside the question is that you said you're, you might be afraid to know, not say something that is in your mind. And I think fee, I have like this weird relationship with fear where if I feel fear of something, I get excited about it. And I think that it's the same fear like you have when, remember when we would go, we used to go to the beach and we would jump off the cliff. Right. That feeling of, fuck, I'm going to die here if I jump <laughs> and I see it. That fear, like that adrenaline rush, it's mm -hmm. the same thing I feel when I have like an idea that might be a slightly dangerous or might, may, might get me in trouble. Like those are the ones that, ah, that me and that we are the agency we enjoy the most. Like it's like that sort of like if we're getting into trouble, it means we're stirring the pot. It means we're driving some sort of change and that, and that it's exciting. Like we always say that when we're, whenever we have to talk with lawyers, like it means the idea is good because it might generate controversy and uh, controversy and people might agree or disagree and generating that debate and just putting that debate out there and a big brand taking a stance and generating a debate and being part of the debate helps the bigger conversation, the mainstream conversation, because it's not, not, it might just stay in the niche elite uh, gloves of intellectual people talking about uh, net neutrality or whatever topic uh, that you want to put in the public space in the, for like the public debate. So I think, yeah, I, for me, fear, like I, I love fear because whenever I feel fear, <laughs> it means that I'm heading in the right direction for me. So I just fucking go for it. Um, but yeah, I think that's like my approach to it. And then um, there are like those sensitive topics. Like if you have, I think that, and I, I'm listening uh, to, and I just recently got into podcast. So I love now being in a, I think this is my, I was once in an advertising pod, podcast. This is my second podcast, but it's my first like broad general public podcast and I love it because I just started listening to Conor O'Brien it's a friend I don't, know yeah. if you that. I don't know if you can plug in a podcast in another podcast like podcast section but <laughs> um, but man that podcast is amazing because Conan talks about that like it's and that and he's talking like as a comedian to other comedians sometimes to Michelle Obama or like all these things he usually talks about to comedians about where they like how they handle how where their comedy comes from and they talk about like those topics that you don't want to talk about, but sometimes then you have to have the right humor, but talking about something in a funny way or, or sort of like not making light of it, but if, if you start sort of like using your power and the comedy to put that topic into the spotlight, into the conversation, you are doing something amazing because people are going to care and people are going to talk about it. Um, 
So I think that's something pretty cool. And and just understanding how they get to that. Like, I love that sort of like back process of understanding what's behind the thought process of these brilliant creative minds of humor or whatever else, like Jordan. <laughs> what, what was in the back of his head when he wanted to win that fucking ring? Man, there's a lot of wisdom in what you're saying right now. Like you're, you're that this way I like talking with you. This is why I like talking with you. You know, what, you were, what you're speaking specifically about fear is something that I relate and this is something that I live by and it's something that I sometimes even teach my, uh, talk about with my patients and, and even my friends, you know. I, that same thing that you're saying, when I'm afraid, I get excited. I, I don't necessarily get that excited, but I do know, like I, I, I tend to use it in real time for my own kind of like self-development. And if I'm having a conversation with somebody that is very important to me, uh, like, uh, like it could be an argument or it could be like whatever. Like, like it, could, it can be a subtle thing about your values and who you are as a person. You know, you are defining yourself every moment of every day by the decisions that you make. The, uh, and you're, you're either going according to your values or against your values. And there's this constant struggle of the world around you trying to shift you into one specific direction. And this direction is like what's okay in, in whatever mainstream that we decided. The mainstream is very different depending on the society that you live by. But in general, like there's a... There's a sort of mainstream. And then there's the who you are as a person besides this uh, manufactured uh, mainstream accept, accepted personality that you should lead yourself by. And every time you deviate from, from that, you're going to have this little fear. You're going you're gonna to have this little fear in the middle of a conversation. You may be like in a fancy dinner with a, with a bunch of people that are like very thoughtful about what they say. And then you come with this thing that may be controversial, but it is part of who you are and it is what you're thinking. And it is, it, it is almost an extent, it is an extension of your personality, right? Like you, you have an arm, you have a brain and you have your thoughts. And if this thought was triggered, I feel like, I kind of have to say it and it, it, like I can be nuanced about it and I can be thoughtful about the way that I say it so that it's, it doesn't come crashing and it can just like come like subtly and nicely. But I, I think that if I say it, I become congruent with who I am and the more congruent that you are as a person, the more what ends up happening is that you create kind of like a little bit of controversy in, 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 not, not in your life necessarily, but you do polarize people around you, like inevitably, right? Like there are going to be some people yeah. that are going to be like, oh shit, everything you're saying, I really resonate with. And there's going to be some people that are going to be like, fuck you, what, what are you thinking? Go burn in hell. And, 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 and that's part of the fear. But then if, like, if you just go, you, just, you start becoming yourself. And the moment you become yourself, you're going to start enjoying your life a little bit more. You're going to start finding yourself surrounded by people that do the same thing that you do, or maybe don't do the same thing that you do, but, it, but, but really respect and really appreciate you being yourself, even if you, if you, even if you are very different. And that is life. I feel like that is life. And I feel like that what you were talking about in terms of using this fear as, as an expression of your work, it has to be a manifestation of your in, like day to day life as well. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe. It's tricky. It's tricky because in advertising, there's your work, the work that you do, the ideas that you put out there in the world and the effect they have. And then there's the first you, the human being behind mm -hmm. uh, those ideas. So it's two different conversations. The first one about the work, it's like you are working for a brand. You are trying to, for that brand to be relevant in people's lives. So they choose the brand over another brand. And the only way that, that you do that, it's by what you were saying, like fighting like the mainstream, fighting what like the status quo, the, the status quo, what a brand is supposed to do. A two for one promotion, a 50% discount, a coupon. That's what a brand is supposed to do. A, a brand is not supposed to get into fucking political debate about the neutrality or right. call out fucking the invasiveness of technology with like Google Home or. Oh, I or, love that Google Home ad that you did. That's hilarious. Yeah, so that was really fun. Like because we were starting at it, like opening up the debate about how invasive technology can be. So a brand is not supposed to do that, but if it starts doing that, 
talking about pe- things that people might care about, then people are going to care about the run. And, and like at the end of the day, it's about attention, getting people's attention and, and caring. And right now, you're just competing against other ads and other brands. You're competing. And, and I think this is like the big conversation in advertising. Now you're competing for attention. Like people might choose to watch a Netflix show ads free, or they might choose to watch your fucking ad and share your ad on the internet because it stands for something and it means something and they resonate to that with that and they agree with that or they hate it and they say, fuck this shit, I hate it. And then that generates a conversation because they're posting in their timelines and their, their followers or their friends, whatever in the social media that there are, might agree or disagree and boom. Like, and, and that's only, you only do that with, I'm not gonna say con- controversial things, but things like that either no brand has dared to go to do before or something that has never been done before. And that again comes with that fear. Like, how the fuck do I pull this off? If no one has ever done it, mm-hmm. I might fail horribly. But and that that makes me scared because if I if if I get a lawsuit from removal or whatever, I'm in big trouble. Uh, and so that, there's a fear, but I think that's sort of like the the compass that's guiding in guiding me or or the people I work with when we create ideas. So that's on the idea side. And then on the personalized side, I think it gets, it goes back to that sort of like competitiveness. Like I have a clear point of view on many things in life and what I stand for politically, religiously, as a person, as my values and whatever. And, and I'm competitive in that sense as well. Like I'm, and, and again, going back to the work, like in my work, we talk about ideas all day. Like my work, it's to come up with ideas and check ideas from our teams and sort of like help them, guide them to come up with, to, to turn the, their ideas in the best possible idea, like to help them build. And, and it's all always about why is it good or why is it bad and sort of like that process behind it, like the reasoning behind the arguments of why is it good or why is it bad. And you have to build your criteria for it. I think that criteria, you building your criteria means reading a lot, knowing a lot, seeing what has been done, seeing what has, like just having a vast knowledge about the thing that you're doing or about other things in life, like topics that people care about. And then sensitivity to know what people, I think that's a very, very, very big thing that in advertising in particular, sensing what people care about. Um, so that's in work, but in life, if we're talking about a, something, and I think this is great about like the high school that we went to that, that, that we went to that. They sort of like challenge, always were challenging us to fucking question everything, question everything. Because when you question the status quo or you question the political system and you question everything, you start sort of like poking holes and seeing where the holes in the arguments are. And, and I love doing that <laughs> with other people's arguments. I love doing that with my arguments to make them stronger. And when we're talking about politics or we're talking about any delicate subject that I hurt someone's feelings, mm-hmm. I'll just try to state my point of view and my arguments and facts in a way that, uh, in a way that sounds convincing because also that's why I do it for a living. Like I try to sell you an idea and I give you all the facts and numbers to support that idea. And it's maybe trying to convince you of something that you're not comfortable with or something that you don't really believe in, but, and I have, arguments to back that up and I have to convince you. So we're also salesmen, like we have to, we just have to come up with great ideas, we have to sell those great ideas. And the only way you're gonna sell them is by having solid arguments and solid data backing you up to support whatever you're saying. And I think that applies to, to the work and I think that applies to conversations in life. And I think that's all, it's also about like knowing your shit. <laughs> Like you cannot I, go jump into a political debate without knowing shit. You're gonna get destroyed if you're talking with smart people. So you have to go prepared. You have that. So okay, so I I have many things to say about a lot of stuff uh, you brought up, and I and hopefully I'll remember it all. But for starters, you said something about competing against attention, and that made me think a a little bit about the 15 minute, 15 second attention span of the general population nowadays. And then you, you have Instagram, you have TikTok and, and general social media. Like people are just going to listen to whatever 15 seconds of what you say, unless they have a, a, a little bit of an expanded attention span or a little bit more interested in yourself as a person or the topic that you're talking about. And 
So I feel like things have become like ads in general have become like, like fast food, you know, like you eat French fries, you get this high dopamine spike. So you feel great. And then you get addicted to it and you want more. And it's kind of like that in this Instagram stories, right? Like you get this dopamine spike because there's an idea that is brought to you. Not necessarily very factual, not necessarily very based on reality. It's just like a, a plot, some like, like uh, a start, like it's, it stirs your emotion in a particular way so that you remember it. And it's kind of like the argument that you want to hear. So you kind of like that and you want more of that shit. And, and, the, and, and regardless of what argument, depending on your point of view, you get one ad, depending on the other point of view, another ad, like if, if we think in terms of politics, et cetera. And, and then you, you may, be, you may be able to, you may know what I'm talking about, like from like a, a very, like a, from a cop, copywriter level, how to spike the emotions of the person in, in terms of like how to do a, an advertisement. But then you decide not to only do that. You probably also do that, but you, on top of that, you exploit that more subtle, uh, more controversial idea behind it. Like that's an extra layer of intelligence and an extra layer of, of like a personal touch to it, right? Like I don't think Burger King will ever come and tell you, hey, what, why don't you do something about net neutrality? Or why, do you, why don't you go explode about the, infring- the potential infringement of your privacy? Uh, but by, by, by all these like internet of things, right? Like it, it, this is something you are thinking about that is very specific to your personality or the personality of the people that you're working with. And you add that to all these other ingredients. And I think that probably is the thing that makes you special. Now, I guess that, that wasn't a question. My question is though, like when you come to talk about values and stuff, how do you, cho- like, like, do you, do you, do you have a, any relationship with, with your values as, as what's good and bad as a person and what companies do you decide to work with and things like that? So uh, to, the, to the first part, I don't think there's, there's a formula. I think to what I was saying, like it's, I think it's, you have to have the sensitivity. To, okay. If you care about something, if I care about the neutrality, then most likely, I mean, it's not being like selfish, self-centered. If I'm seeing a John Oliver episode about the neutrality, it's because he cares, I care, and I, I care strongly. Okay. It's not that, it's like, eh, yeah, it's a, it's, I don't know, like, whatever, an article about Kim Kardashian. No, it, this is neutrality. It's something that might affect my life and the lives yeah. of pe- millions of people and people I love, and so let's do something. If I care deeply about it, then most likely a lot of people will care, care deeply about it, and you have the internet now. You can see in Reddit threads and in the internet if people have opinions about it and, and feel strongly. And just having that sensitivity and the access to the internet to validate if what you're feeling and that sensitivity is right or wrong, that helps a lot, guide you to know if you're going to break through with, with that. Because you're right, the, the clients don't come and say, hey, we need to do something about this. You say, I, I truly believe that your brand should take a stance on this because of this, this, and that, and because of what your brand stands for. So, and, and again, that helps you fight for attention because it's not like people are going to go looking for your ads. You have to make ads that people are going to care about and then they're going to share them and sort of like mm-hmm. the process goes from there. Um, but uh, to, to the, the second point, um, wait, I lost it. Yeah, I, I think I, I was mentioning, I think that it, it is just recently that you are now, you're now leading your own company, is that right? Like got? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that this is, I don't know if it, applies to you just yet but i was wondering into like you have a very specific set of values as an individual and in terms of what do you think you want to uh bring to yourself and the world or whatever and do you have uh like does that relate to to which companies the that you work with yeah i think that like like there's like things that i wouldn't like to like brands or or industries that I wouldn't like to work on. Uh-huh. I don't know, like tobacco industry. I wouldn't like to work on tobacco or mm-hmm. on like, uh, like cigarettes or things like that. Um, and, and of course, like that's personal values of what I believe or not believe in. Um, but then like brands, like, I don't know, we're working for a lot of brands now and the, the beauty of advertising and being like a partner to the brands and not just like a provider of ideas, but like a true partner. 
a partner in the sense that I care about your business and your brand and I'm going to help you thrive. And, and then doing, using the power that the brand gives you to change that brand or help that brand go in the right direction where it adds something. And I think there's a great example that we did recently. Like, and this was a brand that was already amazing and that we loved. And it was its headspace, which you might know. It's the oh, I saw the that. I don't, you know what? Yeah. Not only did I see that, I actually recommended it to my patients. Like, is that, yeah, is, was that your idea? So yeah, like they were, <sighs> they had, they had this thing where like they were doing a pitch and, and they, they were looking, for, they, they, they wanted to do something, especially like something now, like during COVID when like shit's going down, people need to take, take care of their minds and their mental health more than ever. And so we told them, <laughs> like, they were like, what do we do? And we told them, look, what we think you should do as an agency, and this might sound crazy, but listen, just listen to us for a second. Um, we think that you should give it for free to every person that lost their jobs in America because the person, the, the people that need it the most now, today, it's a 30 million or at uh, that point there were 15 or 20, but then it got to 30 when we launched. Like the 20 millions of Americans that right now lost their jobs because of the pandemic that feel like helpless or that lost their like their, their whatever their their income their, their stability their life stability like mm -hmm. they need it there yes of course they're not gonna get their jobs back because they use headspace but it's gonna help them to get to a very me like mental space and to a very like help their ment their, their focus and their mental health to get back on their feet and once they get back on their feet they're gonna be able to go out search for a new job and and start start again um and that meant like they had the headspace had never done an, an a tv commercial before they, it was like word of mouth and 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 like social media and things like that but they had never done like a big campaign like a big television commercial before and and we told them okay <laughs> we're gonna do this it's gonna be the headspace promise and they had like a lot of commitments that they were doing like they were giving it for free for new yorkers because in new york you hit really bad at the beginning and and for healthcare providers like it was yeah, I got it. amazing things but we were like let's fucking push it let's push it to the limit where 30 million people are gonna be able to get it for free because they need it now and it's gonna get generate a long-term connection with your brand people are gonna be like you were there for me when i was down now that i got a fucking amazing job i'm gonna pay you the highest subscription that you have um, or, and and they said yes, that's the right thing to. It doesn't make like it doesn't necessarily it's not the best business decision, but it's the best human decision. It's the best the consciously decision for the world that we can do right now. And they went for it, and it was an amazing project to work on. Uh, we created like the commitment that was a headphones promise. We offered for free as a as a sort of like a, uh, it was a honor system where you you had to say that you were unemployed. You didn't have to prove it. And, and sort of like that meant that people who were able to afford it knew that they were supporting people who couldn't. And that's also good because if you are a paying subscriber, you know that you're supporting people who cannot afford it. And that also makes you feel good as a human because you're helping people. Um, so that was like a great way of like getting a brand and helping them move in the right direction to do what's, what we felt was right for the world and making a real difference in the world. And then of course, like it was a massive hit success. Like people were talking about it and how amazing it was for a brand like that to be doing something as big as that. Um, and that's like beauty of Brian Burger King and making these statements about things that people care about. Like you can have use that power that you have for guiding brands or helping brands go in the right direction and, and have that big impact or that big influence in the world. So. Um, you cannot always do that, but when you can, it feels fucking amazing. Right? Um, when you can, when you can use your ideas to, to not just for good, but to to build a, a brand that that is moving the economy and that is uh, providing jobs and and on top of that, doing good things for humanity. Like with like as, as dumb as, as it sounds or as crazy as it sounds, with Popeyes we were giving out free Netflix passwords at the beginning of the pandemic with every order of fried chicken so that you would stay in your house watching, binge watching Netflix and we would give out like free Netflix messages. You stay at home, watch, binge watch whatever you want, eat chicken, stay inside, don't go out. 
and like things like that. Every little thing. Like if with that we managed to get like hundred people to stay home, that lowered the growth. And for that, for, for us that meant a lot. Dude, you are an activist. You're an activist that uses advertisement as a way to improve the world in, in according to your views or, or or either to raise awareness or to make a difference if you can i i know that you don't do it like every single time in every single ad that you do but but you have your mind in that direction you're able to see what is needed in and and you have to be good at pitching these ideas right like like it, it is not usual to to say to somebody, oh, let's make, let, let's give 30 million people a free subscription for Headspace. And let me tell you, so this is a small world. Let me, let me tell you, like you, you, this idea that you came up with has for sure reached a lot of people that needed it. I know several patients and, and I have, and, and I know some, some of the patients, some of them not, some of them not patients, some of them friends that, that have been, uh, that have struggled with, with COVID significantly to the point that they have become unemployed. And that has brought anxiety to these people and, 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 and fear of losing their jobs, or if they're, they have, or, or maybe they lost their jobs, or maybe they're trying to find a job, and then they're getting into this like anxiety, or am I gonna lose my job? Like, like all these things. And then they're getting into these mental loops of anxiety that prevent them from being the best, the best person they can. And, and, and by that, actually making that even more difficult for them to get a job or for them to like get that this next best opportunity. And then comes mindfulness, bringing yourself to the present moment, just like, oh my God, just like focus on your breath. Don't focus on the future. Don't focus on the past, be in the moment, like do the thing that you need to do right now. What is the right action in this moment? And then in that moment, and in that moment, and then focus your attention in the right direction. That's what Headspace does, helps you do that. And I have certainly recommend the moment I saw I saw it on an Instagram post whenever that happened from them. I got it initially where because I, I'm in New York and, and and I was working a lot with COVID patients. So I, I saw that it was free for medical providers. So I got it for myself. And then I saw that it was just free for every everybody that was unemployed. So I started recommending it to, to all my patients that, that were unemployed. So thank you, bro. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Where it's just like, like you're just trying to add our like little grain of, of help, yeah. and and I think like it's all caring. Like when you like when you care about people, people care about you. So like now I I bet that all those people that got it, they care much more about and have a deeper connection with this brand that they used to have before because it was there for them in a moment of need. So. You, you create like brands almost become like uh, your friends or like this sort of like personality. I'm not gonna say person, but it's like a personality that you feel an attachment uh, or some some sort some, some sort of attachment to. So I think that's that's really cool. Um, and again, like in a, such an important topic like mental health, that I think it's like now more than ever uh, in the spot that we need to keep on. Start like generating conversations around it and getting people to care more about it and and of course get me more people to use headspace but because it's good for them not just because it's a brand or it's a company but because it's actually it's that this is a brand that that helps you like that helps you use like be okay in your own mind which it's like one of the toughest challenges in life wow that's amazing man yeah Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. <laughs> but again, so, we're doing ads. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you something. You're having Do fun. You, yeah, you're having fun. You're doing ads. But like, I am seeing this pattern of you, of you really being an activist and really trying to like do the best you can with what you have. And, and what you have is being very passionate and influential through the brands that you're working with. And, and making them... Like, it's like a... Like a win, 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 win situation, right? Like, it, like the brands are winning because they're getting recognition and they're getting recognition by doing the right thing, and that will get them yeah. more business in the long term. Then you are yeah. you are getting more business because you're making them more famous and making them good business. And then this this becomes a, like an upward spiral of just like productivity and activism and just like leading business into the right place, like like making money and and and, and 
doesn't have to be evil, right? Like there is this, there is this convention that the more money you have, the more evil you are as a person. If you're a billionaire, you have to be an asshole. And I I don't think that's necessarily the case. I, I think that you can actually be a person that provides a lot of value to a community and because of the value that you're providing, you're, you're doing very well yourself. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's about that. Like, I, I yes, I love, uh, I love advertising and I love doing ads. Doesn't matter if it's whatever I'm doing an ad for. I think when we do something that, that, that helps people, of course it feels better. Um, like one of like the, the, the first ad, like the first lion that we got, lion being a can lion, like the, the award, this award show, it was for uh, breast cancer awareness uh, campaign. And beyond the award, like we found out that actually like uh, a woman found a lump because she saw the video and she did a self-examination exam and she found it and then she went and, and that helped her. Like that helped save her life. And then you, like that's sort of like the moment where you're like, fuck. We're like fuck. Our ideas can can like can mean something, can have effects on the world, and can even go to the extent of saving a, like a life, which is mm-hmm. powerful. Um, but and I think that's the beauty of, of advertising that we're like training our brains to come up with ideas, and you have to sort of like yeah, like again build that sensitivity to know what ideas will resonate with people, would talk to people, would like touch people's hearts and and that means yeah like sensing that what what they would like care about and then executing it in a way that that they have never seen before or that it's unexpected or that sounds crazy like giving it for free to, to every unemployed person in america which, yes business wise it's crazy but it builds a really really strong brand um or with like popeye said yes we, we are it's a we have to sell fried chicken but uh, and we're doing it, but we're building uh, a strong brand, not just by creating all this equity behind the quality of the product, but also what the brand is doing. And again, it's a New Orleans brand. We did a, a New Orleans strong campaign to support New Orleans during the pandemic and and like sort of like helping like with together with the brand doing what we think is right, which is giving back, helping. And, and doing doing some good, um, which yes, always, always like you're gonna you're gonna like this one. We, we did this thing in New Orleans uh, that you know that there's a lot of street musicians in New in New Orleans because it's like the capital of jazz and people are playing music in the streets and it's amazing. But in the pandemic, there was no one in the streets, so musicians had no income. And with Popeyes, what we did was like, okay, we're like a, a New Orleans brand, a Louisiana brand. We're gonna give them a gig a venue to play at. And because all the venues are closed, the venue is going to be our radio ads. So we, we allow musicians out of work in New Orleans, and then we open it up to the US. It started in New Orleans. Like New Orleans musicians to submit the jingle from Popeye. Like they could record it with like a guitar or a, or a saxophone or whatever instrument they play. They could record the, the jingle from Popeye's, which is like, love that chicken from Popeye's. And they would record it with whatever instrument they had. They submitted it and then we, we bought the right thing. We bought the song from them and well, we buy, bought it. We rented it and paid them royalties on their jingle to support them, to give them an income while they cannot support themselves playing on the streets. So we turned our radios into sort of like this venue for out of work musicians. And yes, you can say, yeah, yeah, it's like musicians, but it makes sense for the brand. It's a brand that has a heritage in the city, in this culture. And jazz is very important to this city, in this culture. So we're supporting that because it means a lot for the brand and it means a lot for the people of New Orleans. So keeping that community alive, you're keeping the spirit alive. And you're keeping like sort of like the, the spirit of the city alive. And that, that's pretty, that, that was pretty cool. Like it's always about finding those ways to do things that people care and, and making it like the most relevant way that you can. I like it. And I like jazz. So thank you for that too. Jazz is pretty cool. Yeah. And I like I'm going to send you some of the links to the songs. That are, they're pretty cool. Like, because they made it their own. Like, there was no guy. Like, this is like, we polished the, we, we like open source and polished the, 
the notes to the jingle so that anyone knew like uh, the, the musical notes on how to play it. Uh-huh. And then anyone could do could do it. Like they could reinvent it. They could change the lyrics. They could play it with, with just drums, with just guitar, with however they want. And, and like, oh, that's, that's cool amazing. because they, that that starts generating like more content around like the brand, and that's pretty cool. And beyond that, yes, you're supporting it. So like, again, like pretty cool, a pretty cool thing that we could do that uh, to support. And I think like that's in these times of need, it's when brands are set like and. The, the, the things that we do are like stepping up more and, and doing fun things. And and I think at this point, like we got to a point where like we also want to give people a break from the sadness or like the, the chaos that it's, you turn the TV and it's all like bad news and horrible mm-hmm. things and COVID and the, the, the curve is going or whatever, like bad news you see there. And, making people laugh again and giving people some entertainment. Uh, so yesterday, and this, so this happened yesterday, like the latest campaign that we proposed was we just, because I think for every brand that we work on, we did something to help people during COVID because that, 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 that like brands needed to do that, needed to be there for their, their, their guests, and their, their consumers, so that they knew that the consumers knew that the brands were there for them. But now like, we see this thing where it's at least we have at, at least you have at least we have the chicken sandwich, which is the Popeye's iconic product. Uh, and we did the ball drop in New York City. If you go to Times Square, uh, you're gonna see that where the, the countdown is. Mm-hmm. It's a countdown to 2021, and it's like 130 days, uh, 28 hours and uh, oh, seconds to go to 2021 because we plan this year to be over. Um, and and it's a campaign like you get like bubble season or like sports canceled, at least you still have a sandwich. And it's funny, it's like, it, it makes you smile. Like, it's like, yeah, it, it's shitty, but I can still eat a chicken sandwich and at least get some comfort in that. And the fact that I can eat, eat, a, eat a chicken sandwich and, and, and have that. So it's kind of like, yeah, that's not like a, it's not doing good in the traditional way of doing good. It's like just giving, putting a smile, I'm a smile on people's face. Uh, and, and that like tells also, it's like pretty cool. Yeah, and I think, you know, changing the emotions of a person that is feeling sad to to a smile, I I like that. That that is something that I certainly try to do with myself most of the time that I'm feeling down. And and I think it's an art to do it. And you know, when when it comes to mental states, I I I do I I am in the belief that emotions can can be changed through 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 just like you, you, you st- different ways, okay. But if you like, for example, you start looking at yourself in the mirror and you start smiling, you're gonna feel like at the beginning it's gonna be kind of weird, but then you're gonna like start smiling and feeling great. It is a ch- it is a sense of like changing these things, and and if you if you spend like 17 minutes smiling in, in, in every 24 hours, it's not a lot, but it's better than 16 minutes, right? Like, and then and then if you do a little bit of that, okay, like in terms of like magnet objective tangi- tangible change in outcomes maybe not that much but it's still pretty important i think and good emotions bring you to good actions and good actions bring you to change so i think that's a really cool thing i think so yeah um, i think that's the core the essence of advertising what we do it's making people feel something either smile either cry if you have like a really emotional execution or feel good or or feel this bond with the brand, this like gratefulness. Mm-hmm. And, and whenever you get to that, and it's really hard, like, I think that the, the problem is that there's a lot of advertising that it's not good and, and that it's not creating those emotions. It's just doing the same old trick the get your two for one, get your coupon, mm. do this and do that. Uh, and then the majority, uh, the majority of the ads are like that or like just, You've seen that a thousand times. Like if you see pharmaceutical ads, they're usually the same. Like it's the same thing. Symptoms may include, and this is what you get. Like that's it. And so, and there's a lot of categories that have those same tropes and cliches when doing ads. Uh, so breaking away from that to make a meaningful connection in a way, either by making people smile or making people care about a topic, or, can, or connecting with something they care about, or uh, making them cry, making them whatever emotion. If you generate an emotion in a person, that a positive, 
not necessarily crying. Crying can be positive if it makes you feel like, I don't know, I need to call my mom now because the right. ad made me feel, feel that. And, and if, if the ad made, makes you feel something, it's going to generate an emotional connection with the brand. And that's how a brand differentiates itself from the competition. And then you get into, yeah, that's what keeps the market moving. And that's what keeps the economy flowing. And then you get into the more emo uh, economical world, economical sort of aspect of it where, yes, it's advertising, but it's one of the things that keeps the economy moving. Uh, and creativity as a key factor in that economic growth um, because it's, it's doing ideas for the sake of, of building brands which drive business and, and doing things that, have, that haven't been done before. And that cha constant challenge of, okay, let's try to do something that hasn't been done before, which gets harder and harder because every day more and more things get done. So mm. I think that's, a, that, that's the biggest struggle in advertising. We have over a hundred years or hundreds of years of advertising and every year there's more ads and there's more explored ground so it's it gets sort of like it's a bigger challenge which i like but it's a bigger challenge to do something that hasn't been done before you usually get to a point where like you, you're seeing ideas and you're like yeah but this they already did like three years ago or this they it has been done and you're always in that pursuit of the new of the of the of the thing that no one thought of the thing that no one dared to create and you want to create that because that's what ends up being groundbreaking. Uh, that, that sense of novelty of like, shit, I haven't, I haven't seen this before. This is pretty cool. And, and that makes people think the same thing. Like, I haven't seen anything like this before. I want to share this. I think this is pretty cool. And in order to do that, you, you kind of have to yourself start thinking a little bit than you thought before, right? Like, you have to be open to something that you haven't thought before. How, how do you do that? Yeah, because there's no formula. Like, right. It's like you have to have a constant open mind to uh -huh. new ideas. Like that's new ideas are what, what we live, uh, like what, what we base our bills, like what we sell. <laughs> I'm not going to sell you an old idea. That right, you can get a, like, there's hundreds and thousands of advertising agencies out there. And all of them can do a two for one or a 50% discount or a coupon. Like, mm -hmm. I think the, the added value is I'm going to give you something that hasn't been done before or that at least we haven't seen that has been done before. Um, and that's creativity, creating something new. Because if not, it's kind of like duplicativity or copyativity, which is <laughs> copying our, copying our problem. It's about creation, right. it's about adding, like creating something that something new something that that mm -hmm. that you haven't like you haven't seen something that hasn't been done and and i think that's a, that's that people are drawn to that to that novelty of 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 newness of i like like, sort of, like people like new things like things that that shock them or or like make make you think of it in a new way so yeah like, if if i were if i were close-minded like i would i couldn't work on this business you have to always keep your mind open to seeing things in a different way like how like the brief is the same like well not the same but the brief is okay we need to drive this business we need to sell more of whatever we're selling how do we sell it there there have like this have, this same product has been sold uh, in a in hundred million different ways for the past a hundred years how do we sell it in a new way <laughs> that's a challenge and then you have to find a, a fresh way in a fresh uh approach and a fresh idea after that approach so and that, that's pretty exciting as well because you go into the office every day and you and, and I think I that's why I feel so lucky and blessed to work in something like this and something and it's something I really love we go in there to talk about ideas mm -hmm. and it's ideas that haven't like new ideas fresh ideas cool ideas funny ideas emotional ideas ideas that people care about and and it's trying to find the best ones and then figuring the fuck out how to make them happen because that's the, the, like, the other challenge. Like, are, does this idea scare us? 
like we feel a little bit of fear when we see it when we talk about it yes okay let's talk to others to see if we can do it fuck no okay let's find a loophole around it let's try to find a way to make it happen <laughs> and then it's okay then how do we produce it like how do we actually make it because when you are doing something that hasn't been done before there's some there's no instruction manual there's not a fucking lego that you get like a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it because mm -hmm. it hasn't been done like the, the, the google home thing like we needed to see if the, the thing triggered the device and how the fuck do we make that happen and they developed us and we had to, to change the audio and that was on the flight like it's and there was no no manual because no one had done something like that so that's i think that's the beauty it's like okay let's let's figure this out let's see how how to pull it off and and let's try to create it and put it out there and then launch day which is the best day because then you see how people react to your idea and now with the internet you get that immediately it's like an instant sense of did it work or did it not work mm -hmm. are you getting mashable to write your idea about your idea for free or the new york times or whatever and i think that was one of the coolest things that happened like earlier this year i got an interview with the with the wall street journal with them sorry with the with the yeah the wall street journal because which is like one of the fucking biggest publications ever because uh they we did this idea about popeye that was Beyonce launched a new collection with Adidas that was called Ivy Park. How many you saw it? And it looked like the color palette. Like the, the, it was maroon and, and brown. And it had the same colors and Popeye uniform. And we're like, and someone pointed out on Twitter, like people, people, a lot of people started like recognizing the, the similarities between Beyonce's collection and Popeye's uniforms. And they were like, a bunch of people on Twitter say, hey, it looks the same. And we're like, yeah, it does look the same. <laughs> and we, we built a, a website in like under five days, an e-commerce website with shopability functions that you could buy shit to just sell Popeye's uniforms to people. Because of, <laughs> of course, the Young Adidas collection sold out in like 24 hours. And then five days later, Popeye's comes out with this fashion line. That it's not a fashion line, it's just the uniforms that people wear in our restaurants. <laughs> and, and we're like, okay, we're just buying from the provider that sells us the uniforms that we give our employees and, and, and sell it to the public. It sold out three times in like oh my 48 God. hours. We sold $30,000 in Popeye's uniforms that we then donated them <laughs> uh, to, uh, to Popeye's foundation, like a non-for-profit. Uh, but we sold $30,000 of people just wanting to buy because we, we did the, photo, the fashion photo shoot, recreating like the poses and the style from Beyonce's photo shoot. So you had like the same like fashion, like just, and just, it's just that's seeing the uniforms and you like, why can't, our Popeye's uniforms be fashion. Who says what's fashion? And then the Wall Street Journal interview, they were like, they wanted to talk with someone from the agency and they're like, okay, I'll talk with them. And there was this reporter asking like, are you like, what, like, what do you think like this is doing to fashion? Like what's, is this a statement about what fashion is and what fashion can be? And like, yeah, man, like, you see you know, what Kanye West is doing with fashion and what like fashion designers are always reinventing what fashion is, what fashion can be. And we're just like, why can't, Popeye's uniforms be fashion. Like, who says what's fashion? Is it New York Fashion Week or whatever? No. Mm -hmm. If people are paying $30,000 to buy Popeye's and then they were reselling them on eBay. <laughs> we were selling them for, at cost, like 20 bucks, 30 bucks. People were reselling them 100 bucks on eBay because now it's a thing. Like, the Popeye's uniforms were cool. Mm -hmm. And it was just a purple seller with the Popeye's logo. People were paying us to wear the Popeye's logo. It's great. It was crazy. But, like, I was on the Wall Street Journal having an interview about... <laughs> redefining what fashion is and i don't know shit about fashion like <laughs> i like <laughs> i don't think my, of myself as a fashionable guy um but it was yeah you're like a shirt and, a, and a, the same shirt every day or then like jeans or something like a short yeah no i yeah i wear like <laughs> i wear sneakers and pants and and a shirt mm -hmm. and that time why i that some days <laughs> when, when we go to pick up an award or something <laughs> but but yeah, like it, it's pretty cool that like you can, like that's, uh, that's also a beauty of it. I can get into technology with Wall. I can get into politics with, with Birkin. I can get into fucking fashion with Bob Lights. I can get into, like, I feel like the coolest thing about advertising is you can, you become almost like a, not an expert, but you, you get to touch all these other industries and all these other art forms, like the, the bot thing. We got to play with a brilliant comedian and got to at least, sense how algorithms work because we needed to get a sense of it 
uh, we get to know, to understand like uh, net neutrality. We get to understand technology and, and how audio works with the, the, the Google Home device. We get to play with fashion. We get to play, we get to, to get into a world of, of mental health and do something about it. Like we can, like the, the world, the worlds are playful and, and you can do anything. <laughs> Uh, and as long as it's relevant for the brand, like music, you can get into uh, like uh, musicians that, and speaking to musicians and giving them your, your your jingle to play. And and I think that's what what I love about it is that it's all, always like this. Every day is like this exploration of okay, where are we heading today? Where are we going? What 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 industry, other industry, we're gonna get into and and try to like shake up. And and that's like really really cool and exciting going into your everyday work like that, like where you're going to basically get to explore the world. It sounds exciting. It sounds like you, you will never get bored of this. Yeah, never. Like, <laughs> no way. Um, and I think, like, yeah, once you, like, now I'm, like, in, an, an executive of the company, if you will, uh, and, and you get more of the executive job. Like before I was traveling a lot, I was in meetings, I was like uh, with clients in planning and, and you lose, well, you like, it's like you're spending a lot of time doing that, but then that's before when you're a creative, like a creative team, a copywriter with an art director, uh, you almost like out of all the hours you work, like 90% of your time, 80% of your time, it's thinking on ideas, like sitting down writing whatever the fuck pops up in your head trying to find a different angle or a new way to to come up with an idea like coming up with ideas in different ways and all that and that's like amazing and that's something that we still do because that's we love doing it and we're never going to stop so we're doing it on the plane we're doing it on meetings like we, like now me and ricardo my partner on meetings we're like slacking each other texting each other with ideas as we are hearing the brief and things like that so uh like I feel like that the other part was more fun. I still enjoy this a lot because I love like building client relationships. I, I love like that, those interactions and, and also like selling ideas, like helping the creative teams, like guiding them and nurturing them, like help, helping them grow and thrive. That's also like a completely different world and it's amazing. Um, and, and again, like I'm learning every day, like I'm learning how to deal how to manage people, how to manage like uh, emotions, uh, and 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 it's fun. It's a, I'm learning a whole new skill set and and applying it uh, as, as as we go and grow. But as long as we are in the world and the business of ideas, I think I'm never gonna get bored because uh, that's the beauty. It's like when I like a great idea. I think like the thing that I whenever I hear a great idea, it makes me feel that thing. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's not fear, but usually it's fear. Uh, it makes me feel alive. Like, fuck yeah, let's, yeah. let's make the world, let's fucking see, let's put this out there and see what the fuck it does in the world. Like what conversations it says. Let's see if people hate it, if people love it. Like let's just put it out there. And that excitement, it's amazing. Like the, when you come up with the idea, when a team tells you the idea, and then when you put it out in the world and you see people react, like those two moments are amazing. And you get a lot of those, uh, hopefully, well, ideally, when you're doing things right, you get a lot of those every year or every month uh, if you're putting constantly campaigns out there. So. Uh, it's a, I cannot complain. I, I think it's a pretty cool gig. Uh, that that yeah, it's it's not as mainstream. Like I can Mad Men put it in the mainstream a little bit, but mm -hmm. but it's it's pretty fucking fun. And what's next? Like, wh what are you gonna do now? Like now you're in these executive roles. So you climb the ladder like to the to the last step. I don't know that. Wow. Oh, you you wanna win an Emmy? How do you win an Emmy? So there's a couple. I could do a, a TV show. Okay. Uh, which I'm, I don't think I'm equipped <laughs> as of now to do it. Uh, like I would need to learn to write for TV and all that. But uh, there's an, actually an, an Emmy for outstanding commercial mm. that I think if one a year. So that's really tough to win. Like you send your commercials and where they pick like five and then you get invited to the Emmys to receive the award. If you're nominated, you still get invited if you don't win. But, um, we want to win one. Uh, so that, and then there's like, the, there, there's a primetime Emmys, there's a, a daytime Emmys, there's like, um, usually for shows, actors and all that, but there's like the one for the commercials and then there's others for 
like broadcast and other things. So I think that we can find our way into like winning an Emmy and or like even creating a show. Like we said, we're gonna create an animated show. There's an Emmy for animated series. We can create okay. an animated series or an active series. I don't know. Like I think that's the beauty of advertising. Like it gets a lot of into entertainment, entertainment, and now like brands are going into that creating shows and creating series and I don't know like if you remember Castaway that was like a big commercial for FedEx and the one the Castaway like, with Tom Hanks with Tom Hanks yeah, that was yeah. like just one big FedEx and and, <laughs> and like he won awards and all that and that's I think the amazing thing like you can come up with a movie and if you do it and if it's well done it's great you're gonna like that you're gonna get that but yeah I think that's like the ambition is okay and Emmy then Let's get an Oscar. Let's fucking build the best age in the world. Let's start winning beyond advertising. Like, uh, things like that. I guess that the next thing after you dominate the world of advertisement, you could start a cult. I think you could do that. A cult? Like a religious yeah. cult? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could start a cult. Like you, you already know how to how to bring the, the, the emotions to people to do to become their best selves. So you just become like a new age Jesus, let your hair grow a little bit longer and you tell them they can be the best person they can be. And, and that's it. And that's it. And then you want life, like literally you, you become the next. But like, do you really like, do you, <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I, I've been watching a lot of shows and cults usually don't end up well. Like it's that, usually like correct. a, uh, they have horrible endings, so um, I'm fine in advertising for now. Um, mm. And I think I really like it too much to to, to quit it. Like uh, I would miss it too much. I would come back because yes, I also want to like write. I want to write eventually. Like it's not like I love advertising more than I love like writing now. Um, and I mm. probably want to remain the same. Whenever I have some more free time, I would probably start writing like. I, I, uh, short stories or a novel or whatever a TV show maybe I don't know uh, but I think that's the beauty of creating like, like, like being in a creative industry or training your brain to to be creative to write things write ideas write scripts write dialogue write whatever from your writing and that you can expand your writing to other things uh, mm -hmm. well music I couldn't write because I'm hard I'm like <laughs> I, I really bad at music <laughs> you probably know that <laughs> runs in the family uh, I remember we made a song one day, um, like uh, it was a rum song. Do you remember that? It was a oh yeah yeah yeah. We made it was not just a rum song. It was a music beat. Uh, it was for a class. We had this. I was in college, and we had to like the, the, the ode. The rum. ode to rum. The ode to rum. Yeah, it's yeah. On, it's on the YouTube. You can look it up. It's the <laughs> ode to rum. That, well, it's in Spanish. It's a lot of rum, but but um, I, I think I have it. In my child, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll look it up on YouTube. Maybe uh, I'll add but, it as in the description of this episode. That'd be hilarious. Yeah, the beauty of that was, okay, they told us, uh, you have to make a music video. I was like, fuck. And at that time, we were playing World of Warcraft a lot. <laughs> and I recently started playing again, which is pretty cool. Uh, but... Um, which uh, you, you may that, you may lose your life again if you do that. Yeah, that's a problem. You have to be careful with that game. Uh, so I was... We, I did like I, I was like I'm not gonna shoot a music video. I'm playing this game. I can film the screen and record this music video here. There's a pirate ship there. We can all drink this potion that turns everyone to pirates. So I called you, my brother, and my cousin, and then some friends. And I bought po potions in the auction house. The potion that turns you to pirate. And I, I hand potions to all of you. Tell you I told you, okay, drink the potions. And I I directed the video. So I said, okay, now you guys run up the plank and jump into the water. And then you all did that, and I recorded from my screen. It was free from iPhone. I made a guy throw up in one of the buckets in the, in the pirate ship. And we were like kind of party in the pirate ship, fighting in the pirate ship, like jumping on. It was really fun. But see, like that's like that's creativity. Like I, I was kind of like directing a music video on a game, um, and then we wrote the lyrics. That was pretty fucking funny. And you you sang the song, which was great. It was a it's, it's a really funny song. Oh, that was hilarious. I completely forgot about it. The good old days, <laughs> playing whoa, drinking rum. Oh, my God. Well, I, I still drink rum every once in a while. You know. Oh, yeah, I, I love rum. Oh, so tell me something. You're in Miami right now. How, how often do you go to the beach? Uh, not as often as I, 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 I wished. Um, 
with COVID now, of course, it's like impossible. And, um, Is it like you're, that, you're not allowed to go to the beach well, right now? They're closing some of the beach. They're opening some, but I don't know what's the deal now. So I'd rather just not mm -hmm. go. Um, but I think I would go like once every, depending on the year, like once every three months, once every like two months. And if it's summer, like you go a little more often, like once a month. But yeah, I should go more. I should yeah. enjoy the beach more. Yeah, man, and and we should definitely have a a, a Puerto Rico reunion. Man. Yeah, for sure. Every year. Every year we should do that. December, oh. go drink rum, yeah, sing man. songs in the in the fireplace. Oh yeah, I miss Those that. Those were the days. Yeah. yeah. I still doodle. do a little bit. Of, you know what? We're, oh, I still I still have a doodle with he, with me right now. Yeah, I play I with a here, right here. We could play. Oh, we maybe play we can do over soon. <laughs> do like a world championship supreme oh, champion supreme we should do that i'm gonna ask paulo to do that too and and eduardo and Jota. okay it's yeah. happening champion supreme champion that was the thing the, 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 yeah the, like the, the, champion, champion, the, the champion supreme yeah. champion yeah, yeah. Champion. all right what? but you have to be like you have to be like super honest because you have to show your diet your oh, diet that's true time, so. well i guess that we could move the the, the thing yeah, you have to point you have to point at the die every time yeah but that, yeah that's a that's a pretty good game it, it, it's a lot of like and like psychoanalysis of who the fuck is lying and who's not right. it's called liar's dice in english actually yeah i know i just found that out when i moved here okay so like, I, I, read, I read a little bit about liar's dice and i read specifically that I don't know if it was created by pirates, uh, the, the, yeah. the, the colonizers, or if it was created by the native, in, like the indigenous South Americans. Do you know the story? I don't, but what I, what I think I read at some point, I forgot, it was, uh, was kind of like a pirate game. Because yeah. they, and, and also I'm not sure, I'm not saying that this is like kind of like historical, uh, some historical like recording of, <laughs> what actually happened but in, in Pirates of the Caribbean. Right, I remember, yes. Jack Sparrow plays like a version of Liar's Eyes. But yeah, yeah. That's, you know, let's not take Pirates of the Caribbean as a historical uh, recorded event. But yeah, I think it's a part. We, there, there's something to like, talk about. That, that, that we play that game a lot. Yeah, man. Okay, we well, have to play fun. for sure. And, and, we, and, we, and you should come back in the future to another podcast, man. I love talking to you. Yeah, let's do it. Like, fucking do it on a, a weekly thing. It's really fun. <laughs> I love podcasts. Like, now I just, like, I can't believe that it took me so long to get into podcasting. Like, I, I started, I went on, like, we went, me and my wife, we went to a vacation to North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, like, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. And, and driving up there, like, the, I don't know, 11 hour drive, we we're like, okay, we're not just going to listen to music the whole time. We're going to listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. And at that point, at that point, I didn't know that you had a podcast, so I were listening to the Conan O'Brien book. It was fucking amazing, like it's so entertaining. Like I'm engaged the entire time because the conversations are so smart and so deep, mm -hmm. and so just like funny. Like you get to understand how people think, and I think that's fucking amazing. Like I love getting that knowledge of okay, how does this guy write such great lines and comedy, and how does this amazing thinker think? And then that's very, it's very cool. It's like you go deep behind people's heads when they're just talking on a microphone. A hundred percent. That that is my passion. Like, if there's one thing I can't get enough of, is like just hearing and understanding how the best people in the world think. Like how the the most successful, the most thoughtful, the most creative, the most like wh whatever your your field of expertise is. I want to know how you think and I want to understand you and I want to apply it to myself and I want to yeah. everybody, I want everybody to know because in, in like, I think that you, you're an amazing example of somebody, you, you come from Ecuador, nobody like a lot of people don't know like that Ecuador exists. Like uh, you're, you're, nobody knows you. You're like nobody in, in like you finish high school. You, you, you're like funny, you're creative. And then you come up with this cool idea and then suddenly you start climbing the ranks. You become number one in the world in your, in your area. This is through my mindset. Like, that's the only thing. Like, you have your mind, you have your body, and you can move it. And you moved it in the right direction for a certain period of time. And then you achieved success. And, and that's what I'm passionate about, man. Like, really learning, like learning from the best. And also when, when we're doing very, like, we all get sad. We all get anxious. We all get like if this is a 
a natural, they're, they're, those are all natural uh, parts of the human experience. And, and we can sometimes stay there for too long and then we come out of it towards the other side. And that's just like a journey that I like helping people out with. Like I, everybody, I think that, I'll, that most people have the potential to become outstanding and exceptional in one thing in their life. Now, will everybody apply themselves to that? I don't know. Probably not. Okay. You have to find but, it. Right. First you have to find, but there's so many weird things. Like I was yesterday listening to, uh, to a podcast, actually Joe Rogan, and he was talking to David Blaine. And, and David Blaine was telling a story about this guy that wanted to cheat. He wanted to cheat in Las Vegas, like uh, throwing dice. So he literally decided that he was going to do this at age 12, this person. So what he did for the next 10 years, 12 hours of the day, every day for 10 years, he, he just threw dice, just threw dice. And he got so good at, at the nuance of how to Feeling throw a dice. dice. And feeling it and throw it in a specific way so he would get specific combination of numbers that he yeah. got so good that at age, I, I don't know, then like at age 18 or something, he started working in a casino for a period of time to understand like how the thing worked. And then at some point he just quit and started throwing dice in different casinos around the world. And he's, he didn't explain what what this like uh, where he did it or, or this person's name or whatever but he said that this guy just like does it as a profession underground like, he, he makes enough money that he never gets caught and and he's just like a like a rich dude that learned how to throw dice and i don't know man like maybe they, like you have to be passionate about it if you're gonna do it for 10 years 12 hours a day and yeah. i do believe that every single person has some sort of potential that can be achieved if they apply the right mindset and the right actions. And, and that's what I love helping out people with, like finding them to, a, to, get, to, to, to know themselves enough, first of all, that to, uh, to help them understand that they can be that thing that they don't believe. It's hard to believe that you can be best in the world when you, until you are, right? Like, like yeah. when did you think that you were, like, like, it's just like, it's just a matter of action. I then you. Like, I always, like, I saw the ranking. I was like, yes, of course I wanted it. And I wanted it badly. But yeah. I never thought I was going to make it. Like, and I think it's just, like, what you're saying, it's putting in the hour. Like, you have to first find something you're calling. I think that you are going to put the hours and not going to sort of, like, question it. It's like you are obsessed with it and you are going to put the hours because you love it. And then you just put the hours. The problem is that I, I think the problem is that either more, most people don't find it or they find the wrong things and put the hours in the wrong thing not mm -hmm. in their true calling. And then, like, it's like what I was saying, like, if you put Messi to play baseball or another sport that in soccer, he's probably not gonna be the greatest full time. He has to play soccer. He has to be Messi, have that calling for soccer, the skill for soccer, and then put the hours in soccer. But if he does something else, and I think that's the crazy thing. Like, if you think about, if every human being would find his true calling and put in the hours and make, like, follow it and come in and, go for it like society would be like a much different place. but i think yeah it's like either you quit halfway if you find your true calling and you because like i cannot find like it's hard to find the reason why and maybe it's either lack of commitment lack of of of, of wanting it like not being ambitious enough or being at the being at your wrong calling that's what i think like I was listening the other day, like, I got really into Hamilton, the musical, like, it's yeah. brilliant, like, I saw it right before COVID hit, like, in, in January this year, like, uh -huh. they were in Miami, and I was, like, mind blown, and then they released it on Disney, and I was, like, oh, man, this is so, like, powerful, and that song, like, the Satisfied. That, yeah, you uh, can never be satisfied. Like, I know that, I actually know the, the whole thing by memory, I think. God damn, yeah, it's, like, really good. So, that, that song, I was, like, yeah, like, I relate to that. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be satisfied. Like, I wanna be, I wanna take my agency to be the best agency, and then I wanna win an Emmy, and then they probably wanna something else. Like, it's it's that sort of like, I don't know if it's relentlessness. I don't know what's the word. I don't even know what's the word in Spanish. That sort of like constant dissatisfaction with, yeah. yes, you, I'm satisfied. I got to number one, yeah. but then I want more, and yeah. then I want more, and then I want more. 
So that constant pushing yourself and reaching that sort of like thing that you thought was the limit and then, ah, wait, but there's more. And then there's more and then there's more. And I think that's how you reach that. A hundred percent, man. You have that thing that Michael Jordan has. That it, it, I, I do think it is called relentless. Like I do think that you are relentless. relentless. It, it's this engine, like just, just pushing yourself to the next thing. Just like, what else are you going to do in your life? Like what else are you going to do if not do a little bit better today, right? Like, what else? Yeah. Like, I just want to do better ads than I did before. Mm -hmm. So it's always like, okay, better, better. And maybe then it's better other thing. Uh, yeah. Like it's an ad that becomes something beyond the ad. And I think that's the beauty of some of ideas that, yes, they're ads, but they become bigger than ads. And then like, for example, you get a fearless girl. It's a statue, but it's an ad, but it's a statue. And it means so much more uh, or things like that that start changing the world and starts from advertising change the world that's the goal yeah man and it's some i mean of course it's hard but it, but if you get into the right mindset of finally loving what you do there's no other option because it is yeah. what you love to do and, the, and there's no other challenge than to do a little bit better and you know it starts with like as you say finding finding your calling after you find your, like, and, and what, what does that mean, finding your calling? And like, like really thinking about it yourself, like, who am I? What do I want from my life? Where do I want to go in my career? Who do I want to share my life with? And really being thoughtful about all those things, then, then putting in the hours. And, you know, we sometimes think all these things are like super difficult, but if you really think about this, let's say an, an example would be guitar playing. If you want to be like, one standard deviation above average in terms of playing guitar, you in ter like just having the general world population, you probably can do that by training two weeks. Like probably like, like and then you want to do another standard deviation. Okay. You may need two months. And then like yeah. after the, the first couple of years, you were going to find yourself like in the top 10% of the population and that's when it gets harder. And that's when you really have to focus your attention. And that's the grind, the forever grind. And yeah. No, and I, and I do think that, yes, it's mostly about the grind. Like, it's 90% about the grind. But I do think there's, like, a little bit of luck. Yes. A, like, a, you have to have the calling and the talent, the predisposition to, for that thing that you love whether it's arts or sports or whatever, you have to have the calling, you have to like them, you have to be good at it. Yes. And then the 90% of the grind. And then a little bit of luck. Because I feel like I was really lucky to like meet the, met the people that I met, like the two, the mentors that I met. Because if I hadn't met them, I wouldn't be able to sort of like achieve what I achieved. Like the, the yeah. people that taught me how to think on advertising that, like my former bosses, my mentors, like Anselmo, Stone, Joaquin, Ignacio, like all the, these, the guys that gave me my first shot and that they believed in my ideas and they believed in yourself. Like you have to have one. Like if, again, going back to the Messi example, the Jordan example, if they wouldn't have met these people, these coaches, and uh, sort of like help them keep going in the right path, you're fucked. Like if you're stuck in like a shitty team or whatever without mentorship, that's it. Like not no matter how much though, if you have, an extraordinary, extraordinary ability with outstanding grind, you're eventually probably one someone's gonna find you and, and choose you and take you into that right like environment. But I feel yeah, there's also a lot about the environment and sometimes getting to in that environment, it's luck. And then you can like luck, it's luck. It's just that you sprinkle know, of luck that you need. I agree. I, I agree that in order to become the number one person in the world in one specific area, there is a, a luck factor. Like, 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 yeah, yeah, for sure, right? Like, for, for sure, there, there, there has to be. And I also, but if you put on that grind, that 90%, even if you're not the number one person, you're going to be right there. You know, like, like, like you're going to be around. You're, you may not be the number one, but you're going to be around even if you're not that lucky. As long as you're smart about it, as you were talking about mentorship, like may you call it luck. And I think that again, I, I think that you're being a little bit too humble because these mentors that you were able to find, like that didn't happen by, 
just luck, right? Like you were really good and you were, a, you, you were very thoughtful about who you wanted to reach. And it, it just so happened that your words were, was really good and, this, and, and you're also a really nice guy. So, so interpersonally, you are very approachable. Your work ethic is extraordinary. And you're, the quality of what you do is amazing. So naturally, like it is the natural outcome that somebody that really knows about something is going to want to work with you and it's going to want to teach you. And, and, and I think that finding the right mentor, like it's something that you probably did. You know, like you probably Google who is a big person and you try to get close to that person and you try to get in touch with that person. This is something that, you, that, it, that it is part of the grind, I feel like. What is the next step? How do I achieve that next step? And then you go, okay, yes, I need a mentor because yes, there's only so much advertisement that I'm going to learn in freaking like college, right? Like there's only so much that you're going to learn in a master's degree or YouTube. Like, I don't know, whatever. But if you want to go to like a elite level, you, you got to find the elite people and, and you got to make, like, you got to make sure that they, they, they want to teach you. And the only thing they're going to want to teach you is that if you're extremely wor good work, uh, extremely good and have an extremely good work ethic and you're interpersonally like relatable. I can't hear anything yeah, you're saying. Now. Okay. Now I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's sort of like how we're building the agency. We're not finding, we're not hiring like these extremely awarded talented individuals. We are, finding great people like that's the first like filter if you're not a nice guy which in advertising there's like a lot of people that are not nice there's a lot of egos if you're not nice you're not in because it's about the culture and the environment like an environment that promotes creativity and that that empowers like it's not like bringing you down or criticizing it's like it's building and so we find nice people that have that fire you don't have to have a proven portfolio or like all the awards on your belt under your belt you have to be a nice guy that has the fire to want it to be fucking amazing. Yeah. If you have those two things, you're probably gonna, and we put you in the right environment, you're probably most likely gonna thrive. Yeah. Uh, like the name of the podcast, plugging it yeah, in. Man. But but yeah, no, I think that's that that's kind of like the thing. And now, like at this level, helping people achieve greatness, like winning awards and doing great work and seeing their work in fucking New York Times and Wall Street Journal it's fucking amazing because you feel sort of like this pride of, of damn, I help this guy. Like it's, that is just as obsessed or even more obsessed that I am with this industry. Mm -hmm. Like achieving this thing that feels so fucking good uh, because like in some way I felt it before. And now I think I'm, I'm enabling and just creating the right environment for them to feel that same thing of, of doing great work. And that feels even better than doing it in, in yourself. It's more like generous, in a way. Yeah, man. So you're, you're, you're thinking about legacy now. It's... I can't hear you. A lot of agents... Oh, now I can of, hear you. Yeah, it's weird. A lot of agencies... Uh, there's a lot of great agencies historically, like just uh, like, that left a legacy and a way to do advertising. And I think, yeah, we're, we're trying to build that. We're trying to be the best agency in the world and we want to be the best agency in the next decade and leave that sort of like legacy but for out of the love of advertising because we love this thing and we want to push it forward we want like we don't want it to remain where it is we want to push it to the next chapter like go beyond that and and, and i think we have the love for it <laughs> at least we have the love for it and we're trying to go there we'll we'll see like we're, we're pretty we're pretty relentless in that sense so uh that's that's what we're trying to do creating this place where people want to come work because they know that, that if they're nice and they are ambitious uh, and they have the fire in their eyes uh they're they're gonna do great work and they're gonna be successful and make a difference in the world amazing According i think the that coolest legacy like creating that environment creating that culture that you know like those guys are that's a place where you want to go yeah. And there are places like that. Like that, that's why when I came to the U S I wanted to go to the best possible, um, uh, training program. That's why, that's why I'm like, that's why I came, uh, I did residency where I did, that's where I did my shell, my fellowship where I did. And I just wanted to surround myself with the best people so that I could absorb from them and just like be the best 
version of what I can be. And it sounds like that's what you, your agency is becoming, which is pretty cool. I can't starting? hear you. But N now I can what? hear you. Yeah, that's weird. Like when I stop talking, like it just mutes me. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, like that's where like we're two years in building the agency. That's where we're trying to go for. There's a there's like this agency called Wild and Kennedy. They've been at the grind for thirty years. They become there are the best agents in the world right now, and and they created that. So it can be done. But now we want to do it as well. So I like that's that's yeah, it's the beauty of you like. Coming to the U.S. to work as an Ecuadorian uh, and playing in this league because this is kind of like the Champions League of fucking advertising. Mm -hmm. This and the U.K. But it's like playing at that level. Like you have to fucking perform at the highest level, uh, and that's fucking amazing because it just pushes you to be better. Like you can, there's no not performing. Like it's you always need to be great, and it, then it's from great to excellent if you want to be the best in the world. So I think that I think that we should end it here. I think we should like I think that this is a lot, this is a lot of wisdom that it, we have put in this last I think almost two hours. I think this is the longest podcast so far. What, I can't what, hear you. Are you what? Uh, no, no, I can. That's that's a record. That's cool. What? Why are you gonna name it? Because I, I was hearing the, the one you did with the Hota and you named oh. it like it was death, death and taxes. I, I love the naming process of the, 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 the episode. Okay, so this one should be called Relentless. Like it. That's pretty cool. Well, you're the creative guy. Tell me what do you think. S sums it up pretty well. Yeah, I think so too. From Relentless. So you sneak in the rum in there. So wait, I didn't hear what you said. Like, I could, we couldn't hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, now I can. Begin rum and make rum lendless. So rum lendless. lendless. Yes, <laughs> perfect. That's what we're gonna. That's what how it's gonna be called. I love. I love wordplay. <laughs> Puns. All right, man. Well, thank you for thank you for taking the time, and it was great talking to you, man. And I'll I, I'll see you soon. I'll be in Miami at some point. If you come to New York, let me know, and we'll hang out. And otherwise, I'll see you in Ecuador, and we'll go to Puerto Rico. You I can no. hear you. I think, there we go. There we go. Yeah, it's like it has that lag, um, for sure, man. Like, I may thank you so much for inviting me. This was amazing. Love, always love talking with you. Like, we have like, always these deep conversations. Usually over rum, I didn't have my rum this time. But thank you for the time. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge honor, and hope we can meet soon, and and hopefully in Puerto Rico, yeah. having some some rums there. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, talk soon and thank you again. Thank you.